Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here and today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Oz Machine Company Roosevelt. This is a, uh, a 2022 model. I, I took a look at this knife a few years ago and I liked it, but there were some just a, a couple of little things. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman behind Oz Machine Company sent me a sample uh, to take a look at and I am extremely impressed. This is not mine. I don't get to keep it. It's going back. Um, but uh, man, there's a lot of good here. If you guys didn't know, um, the Oz Machine Company Roosevelt is made 100% in the United States, uh, actually in Attica, Indiana. Uh, now that makes these things very, very expensive, not just because they're made in the United States, but because they are made very small batch, right? Um, but uh, I, I'm really happy to say that these are being done um, just insanely well. Uh, another thing that I really like is the fact that the blade, which is in MagnaCut, is actually hitting the uh, optimized range for uh, Rockwell hardness. So we have 63 to 64 on that MagnaCut blade. Very cool. That is what people like to see when they're going out of their way to get something that is made in the USA, small batch produced, right? Hitting that, that finally, the cherry on top of everything is, is getting the blade heat treated correctly. These are what I would refer to as a semi-custom or a mid-tech. So we have, you know, some handmade sort of hands-on elements and then also uh, some machine elements as well. Uh, thanks so much to Oz Machine Company for letting me take a look at this. Thanks to my patrons for supporting me. And please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you're wondering, how do I get my hands on one of those? I really want that. And I don't feel like I need to sit here and listen to your review. Um, it, this is one of those knives that has a really high demand. So there's a lottery system. Um, I would not go to the secondary market and pay secondary market prices. Um, it's just one of those things where you kind of have to get lucky to have the opportunity to buy it. But paying attention to Oz Machine Company on Instagram uh, and signing up for email notifications on his website is definitely a good idea. I'll make sure that his website is linked right down below in the description. Let's go ahead and get a measurement. Uh, overall length of the Roosevelt coming in at exactly 7 inches. The blade length is exactly 3 inches. And the cutting edge is about 2.85 inches. Let's go ahead and do some size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1 and the Ontario Rat Model 2. This knife is definitely closer to the size of the Rat 2, but it's got more height to it. It's got more presence to it because of, you know, these areas up here, the wider area on the blade and handle. Uh, how about up against the Demco AD 20.5? How about up against the Spyderco PM2? And the Spyderco Para 3. Uh, Para 3 has some similar ergonomic lines. It's kind of, they're not this, they're not anywhere near the same thing. It's just, if, I, if I'm going to relate this to any of the knives that I, you know, use for size comparisons, it is, I guess, the closest to the, to the Para 3. Uh, last but not least, let's put it up against the Benchmade Bugout and the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue. All right. How is the action on this guy? So they make everything in house, and I mean everything. I said, I you know, I had messaged him, and I was like, so it's, you guys do everything in house except for what, like the bearings? And he said, actually, we make our own bearings. <laughs> they do everything in house. This thing, the action on it is baffling because the blade is so thin and so light. I just can't. Oh, man, it, it really is essentially a guillotine. Um, this thing is crazy smooth, but not like in a, uh, you know, it makes me nervous kind of way. It's just, it's tuned exactly right for how your, your hands would manipulate an object of this size and dimensions. Um, <laughs> the action is so, so stupidly impressive. There is no drag at all. There's no, it's just ultra consistent. It's wonderful. Very easy to deploy thanks to this little sort of half moon opening hole, right? Uh, disengagement of the lock bar is actually really easy thanks to some heavy scalloping on either side. It's also been knocked down so it's not super sharp. Reverse flicking it is definitely the most satisfying and easiest way to deploy it in my opinion. It's just 
second nature. This this thing is very, very friendly. It is very accommodating. It feels exactly like what it was meant to be, which is uh, a simple, elegant, uh, you know, ultra utilitarian EDC cutting tool. Um, it does that perfectly. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything about how this was how this was done. Uh, very beautiful action. Let's go ahead and do carry profile. So the thickness up against the Spyderco Para 3, you can see here that this knife is definitely on the thinner side. Length and height up against the PM2 and Para 3. This is also another area where this knife is going to shine. It is very compact and very, very friendly in the pocket. While it is, I guess, on the taller side, if you're going to you know, compare it to something like the Benchmade bug out this, this way. Still, you know, not quite as tall as the PM2 Repair 3 and it's shorter this way. Um, we are looking at titanium with his, uh, his, I think this is the golf putter texturing, which is pretty cool. Um, but we have titanium that has been milled out on the inside and then we have, uh, a magna cut blade. I'll let you guys take a look at the inside of this knife. It actually has been pretty, generously milled on the inside it really just feels ultra ultra lightweight the balance is right there behind the pivot but exactly i mean you can see maybe like almost a half an inch but it's exactly where your fingers are going to lock in in this position you choke up up here really there's no difference <laughs> even with the balance being back a little bit the the whole thing is so lightweight um i i don't even it it feels like it might weigh less than three ounces. I know that I know that that's probably not true. Let's find out. God, man. <laughs> I honestly, so I was thinking in my head, I was like, it's probably like, it feels like it weighs like 2.8 ounces, but it's probably going to come in at like three and a half. No. Uh, ratios on this are perfect. We have three ounces of weight for three inches of blade and it's full tie. Uh, that's beautiful. Let's go ahead and do a hardware check. I'm going to get out my tools. As per usual, my tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the section of my description that talks about the tools I use on this channel. I am pretty sure that that pivot is a T8. We're just going to check real quick. It is. How about the body screws? Also. So he's making all of this stuff, the screws and everything. It's not, these aren't like grab bag screws he's, he's making these right and so and i know people are people always flinch when we get up into this arid area of basically universally considered expensive right and people are just like how can i have it? well whatever your frustrations are it is not cheap to do what he's doing it's not cheap to create your own screws your own bearings right <laughs> it's it's not cheap to do it with a very, you know, a small staff where your output is, you know, low. It's not like he's making a thousand of these a day. No, hardly, not even close, right? Uh, it is very expensive to control this, uh, to make sure that quality is on point. Everything is being perfectly fitted. Probably everything, uh, you know, the, the, um, the tolerances are probably within one one thousandth of an inch everywhere, right? Upkeep and maintenance on those machines. It is not cheap to do that, right? So, I get it. Sometimes the things we want are very, very expensive. And I think the easy route is to immediately jump to a conclusion that goes something like, oh, they're obviously just trying to rip our faces off or, you know, what a, you know, something like that. Um, you can do that. But the fact is, it is extremely expensive to do this. That is why the price is so high. Uh, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's not a matter of, oh, you know, there's deception. <laughs> there's, there's malicious behavior behind the curtains. No, it's just expensive to do. And that is the case. Um, but uh, I just find it very impressive that this, <laughs> uh, the, this is all being done to such a high level of quality. It's really amazing. Um, let's see here. Uh, blade stock thickness. Let's measure blade stock thickness. Uh, here we go. Blade stock thickness coming in at 124, this is 124, it's probably 125 thousandths, which is about the same as the Ritter Hogue. I think that's just fine. On the thinner side. Um, I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and move into the meat and potatoes here. This thing is beautifully simple and you, you know, you have the option, uh, of going completely and totally plain, right? 
if you uh, want just like a plain bead blasted uh, titanium scale. I'm very happy that he offers the option for some texturing. I think more texture patterns would be a good idea. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it, it might just depend. He, he might be limited based on, you know, the machines that he's got. He might be able to only do one type of pattern for a certain batch at a time. I don't really know. Um, I've seen a few different things, I think. Um, but uh, I really like this texture pattern. It's really nice. Uh, you can feel it. It's not something that I would say is going to offer uh, a meaningful amount of excuse me, of traction, but it is nice. And it's very, it's just very, very well done. It, it, the way that it reflects light is really cool. Uh, it gives it kind of a three-dimensional look. Um, it actually, you know, initially made it, the scales look contoured. They're not, they're flat. Um, but it made the scales look contoured initially. Um, I just, it, I, I'm a bit, you guys know that I'm a big fan of like, you know, anywhere from a medium to a high polished titanium and a continuous pattern. I love, you know, like diamond patterns, but if it's just diagonal horizontal lines, right, whatever it is, I like it when it's a continuous pattern. And that's what this is. It's really cool, really unique. Uh, I like it a lot. Um, it's like I said, manipulation of this thing is just, it's almost second nature, right? It's like, I feel like a person who has never successfully reverse flicked a pocket knife could pick this up and do it. I mean, the thing is just begging to be used properly. It's just, it's, it's almost like, <laughs> I don't know, like a, it's like playing a, a video game where everything is automatically done for you, right? If you're playing a first-person shooter, it would be like auto, like, aim assist, you know? <laughs> Mission accomplished assist. Everything is so, uh, just, the way that this is done is just, it's just begging for a human hand to pick it up and use it the way that it was meant to be used. Manipulate it the way that it was meant to be manipulated. Um, and I, I really like that. Uh, that's the thing that I like about something that's simple. You know, you could look at this and you could reduce it and say, oh, it's just a, it's just another titanium frame lock, right? And it's just got flat scales. It's kind of boring. Sometimes I see that and it bothers me because it looks like it's just being pumped out for the sake of, you know, sort of a attracting a base level uh, audience of people. It's just a kind of a safe design. And here, this will, this will be appealing to a wide range of people. Here it is. And we can make a bunch of them, right? It's just kind of a lazy effort. This is, this I feel like is different. It's, it's very specifically supposed to be just this, right? <laughs> and it works perfectly. Uh, the, uh, uh, the thing that I like is this, uh, this setup here it allows for an absolutely perfect ergonomic experience. This is beautiful. And it fits my hand perfectly. Uh, I wear an XL glove. I don't have the biggest hands in the world, but if your hands are about my size or even honestly a little bit bigger, you can see here, I still have a ton of room on uh, you know the left side of my index finger and the right side of my pinky. Still plenty of room. Just This is so crazy comfortable. The edges are so nicely knocked down in here. There is no part of this that feels uncomfortable. I feel like I could use this knife continuously for hours with my bare hand and I would be just fine. I love this type of you know profile where we kind of have, it, it's similar to the Shaman and honestly many Spydercos where you have a large toil area that's really, most of this is still on the knife handle, right? But you're just, there's so much room for you to get a comfortable, you know, grip and get your index finger in there without feeling like, oh, I might accidentally run it up on the blade. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect, right? Holding it like this, which, you know, most of the time, Edie seeing a knife like this, right? The, the, the things that I most commonly do with pocket knives is open packages. So oftentimes I'm holding it like this or like this. Beautiful. It's very, just ah, absolutely wonderful. Really, really nice. Edges are knocked down everywhere. There's no spot on this knife that feels unfinished or lazy, right? Every last little edge, see, it's just ever so slightly knocked down there. Every last little edge is nicely knocked down. Um, the overall fit and finish, seating of the hardware, everything is perfect. There are no awkward gaps on either, you know, on, on any side of any of the hardware. It doesn't look like anything was mashed together. Um, this is perfect. These are being machined absolutely perfectly and I love that uh, the blade very simple we have mostly I mean essentially a full flat grind a um, little bit of a swedge up here the inside of this sort of half moon opening hole has been knocked down like I said really easy deployment 
Um, it's got a, uh, a tumbled finish on it. You have a few different options for finishes. Depending on what you choose, the price is going to go up. Like, for example, um, the uh, the base price on these is $700, which, again, is high, right? But <laughs> whether or not you want to admit it or m- maybe you didn't know, maybe you know and it's just not something that you you can sp- you know place specific value for yourself on, these are in small batch, right? So if he's going to... Uh, you know, run a business and turn a profit and be able to continue to pay to produce these things and support himself and his family, right? Then there has to be, the markup has to be appropriate, right? So he's not, you know, I'd venture to guess, uh, he's not able to um, make profit on volume, say, the same way that Rick Hinderer does, uh, or somebody who's a much larger operation, right? And that's, this it's it's always been the case, right? Um, so that considered, right? I mean, this this he he is in the right territory. He's in the right general territory for pricing, um, and uh, I can't say that I really, you know, I'm really that offended or that the price looks like that outrageous or anything. No, um, I uh, you're gonna what I started to say was you're gonna pay fifty dollars extra for the texturing that you're seeing here and various other things like, you know, maybe the finish on the blade, uh, the, the type of, I think certain anodizing um, is uh, like not extra, uh, but then, you know, changing materials for the pocket clip. Uh, if you go with a more exotic material, obviously you're going to pay a little bit more money, things like that, right? The same type of stuff that we see when we're looking at, you know, custom and mid-tech knives, you know, made small batch by small operation um, where you have various choices for materials and things. So, uh, if you look at Olamic Cutlery, it's extremely similar. We're talking about extremely similar pricing, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I. Uh, that being said, right, just having handled as much as I have handled, right, things that are in this specific tier, this specific caliber of small batch USA, you know, semi-custom knives, uh, things that are much more expensive, things that are much less expensive. Yeah, it kind of feels right on the money to me. Um, the, uh, blade is going to be perfect <laughs> for day to day stuff. Obviously, uh, this is not something that you're going to take out and baton with, right? Uh, not gonna, not gonna do that. Knives don't necessarily need to take on, um, uh, some sort of inhuman amount of excess durability as the price goes up. For some people, it's hard you know, to wrap their head around, like if the price is going to be more than the thing should be more durable, it should be able to withstand more and more and more ridiculous levels of abuse. No, that's not how that's not how that pricing works, right? It's the amount of work that goes into it, where the work is being done, what type of work it is, etc. Things like that, what what the materials are made out of. Um, but uh, no, this isn't the type of knife you're going to take out and baton with. This is the type of knife that you're going to carry and use daily for regular cutting tasks. Now, can it be taken out and used to, say, break down cardboard boxes for a couple of hours at a time or process wood, rope, rubber, things like that, thick styrofoam, stuff that you would cut in a work setting? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is made to do that and do it efficiently. Um, this is an incredibly comfortable thing to hold, <laughs> an incredibly comfortable thing to manipulate. And the way that the blade is ground, which is very thin, holy moly, this thing is just screaming. It's like, oh, I can hear the edge. I can hear it, right, as it sort of divides the particles in the air. Um, it, uh, yeah, uh, this this is going to cut, and it is going to cut well. It's a very, you know, sort of standard traditional drop point blade shape, certainly uh, not something that that you know we we haven't seen before, um, but uh, yeah, it's perfect for this knife. I mean, again, the idea was clearly let's make a an easy to manipulate, um, simple, kind of gentlemanly, straightforward cutting apparatus, um, and let's make it in the USA. Let's make every part of it right here in the USA. Make it beautifully simple to operate. Mission accomplished. Backspacer looks good. Very simple backspacer. Uh, Just a couple of screws. I don't think I mentioned, you know, uh, the ease of disassembly is just beautiful. We just have the pivot, a couple of body screws on each side, hidden screw for the pocket clip, bearings, blade, right? Easy, really easy to take apart and maintain. I mean, it couldn't be simpler. There's a reason that I prefer. I always say minimal hardware is two screws. You want to have, 
you know, T8 or bigger. Uh, the you know disassembly should be about as straightforward as possible. That's what this is, right? It's sandwich construction with a backspacer. Very simple, minimal steps, and because it is machined essentially perfectly, uh, it should go back together exactly the same way every single time. Another thing that I love about this is that there's no lanyard thing anywhere. Like who cares, right? It's not there. You don't need it, right? I mean, if you're somebody who really loves to put lanyards on their pocket knives, well, sorry, this doesn't have it. Um, I don't know. Maybe he has an option to drill a lanyard bar or hole or something. I didn't. I didn't see it, but I just don't care that it's not there. The pocket clip, the way that it carries, is just perfect. In and out of the pocket is beautiful, by the way, because of this nice ramp under the clip, which is milled. By the way, it's not a stamped clip. Carry depth, nice and deep, right? Beautifully simple, so easy. This is everything. Every part of this knife that you interact with with your hand or your pocket or whatever. It just does it with maximum efficiency, right? Just right to the point. <laughs> Perfect. I'd, I'll tell you the one thing that I would prefer. I mean, I'm always, you know, anytime I look at flat titanium, I'm always like, oh, I wish it was contoured, right? That'd be cool. Truthfully, the one thing that I would prefer is uh, instead of an exposed frame lock, we have an inset titanium liner lock. Uh, I think that would be just a little bit better. And truthfully... This thing doesn't really seem to care if you are putting pressure on that lock bar. I mean, I'm, I'm doing that the whole time there. It, it honestly just does not seem to care. Um, so that's that's done correctly on the inside or it's ramped correctly. It just a little bit of excess pressure on that lock bar doesn't seem to affect it. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing that I really don't like as much with titanium frame locks is while you are using them, you're squeezing and you can make the argument, well, that just holds the lock in place. It makes it more secure. Okay. You're also mashing the, in this case, it'd be the steel lock bar insert, the, the face of that chip further into the tang, right? So you are, uh, wearing away some of the life of the lock bar, the more that you squeeze. Because obviously, as soon as the lock bar wears all the way over, eventually you're going to get a little bit of rock. Now, the nice thing here is that it does have a steel lock bar insert, so you can have that chip popped out and put a new one back in, right? Um, I like titanium liner locks uh, because it, essentially, you know, it, it comes down to surface contact and, um, you know, the, the, the lock itself is only going to be as strong as the relief cut. And the relief cut is about as thin as a liner. I mean, I, I, honestly, I think a titanium liner lock would be maybe a little bit thicker. Um, but uh, it's uh, going to be about the same as far as strength goes. And while, yeah, you can't, you know, with the liner, if it were a liner lock, having it recessed or inset, uh, you wouldn't be able to squeeze and really make sure that that lock stays in place. But then again, you know, a proper liner or frame lock will lock out properly without the requirement of pressure, right? Uh, as long as the geometry between the lock bar inserts or the, the lock face and the blade tang are properly done, it's going to lock out correctly. Um, so I think I would just prefer an inset titanium liner lock. You know, it's as I've been, it's like every frame lock that I look at, I think, eh, it'd be better if this area was covered, right? But that's not really that big of a deal, right? That's a little thing. Uh, and I've said that many times. It's just my preference. Uh, it's just I've just come to appreciate liner locks more than exposed frame locks. Um, but it's not really that big of a deal. The um, lock bar insert, excuse me, does uh, double as the over travel stop. You can see that little area right there. That's nice. We have a stop pin located in its traditional spot. Sorry, I was looking at it and not seeing if you could see it on camera. There it is right there. A little tiny bit of shouldering. No blade play. Up, down, left, to right. Nothing. Not a hint. Absolutely solid. It's crazy for how lightweight it is. Uh, you know, it just you you it, it it almost feels like a delicate object, but then it, the lockout solidity is just awesome. Uh, no lock stick, no pivot lash. Very consistent in here, and just ah, uh, the detent is just beautifully perfect, perfectly centered too. Really nice. This is exactly the type of thing that um, you know you want to see. If you are, um, if you're spending this type of money on it, right? There's nothing worse than you know. It's like it's gonna cost a lot of money, right? Even to do it incorrectly. That's I think that's the best way to put it for people who just cannot fathom how a pocket knife, something as simple as a pocket knife, could cost so much money. 
Dude, have you seen what Pokemon cards go for? Do you see what what like the cost of you know art is? Um, or I mean, if you wanna if you wanna dig into like you know how could how could a, an object that has such a simple function um, actually go for that much money? Oh, if you haven't been exposed to some of these other things that I'm talking about, then let me turn your world upside down. I think it should be substantially easier for people to wrap their heads around why something like an American pocket knife costs so much money. Uh, I just, I have no, no part of me finds that behavior excusable. You don't have to buy it, but pretending like you can't understand it is ridiculous. <laughs> I can completely and totally understand why this costs so much money. But... Making something like this incorrectly will also be very expensive, right? Let's say everything is exactly the same except what he churns out is just subpar quality, right? The machines are not, you know, calibrated correctly or there's just poor quality control, right? What it spits out is an Oz machine company, Roosevelt, <laughs> just making it sound like it's some cartoonish machine that's just, you know. Uh, what it spits out is subpar, subpar uh, manufacturing quality, right? Poor fit and finish, things like the inconsistent um, surface finishes, right? That's still expensive <laughs> because of the way it's being done, right? Here in the United States, right? Small batch. That's expensive. The costs on his end are still high, right? Uh, but that, of course, is not the case. It is that 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 you know what comes out the other end is poor quality. No. What's coming out the other end is extremely high quality. This is obviously, obviously the quality control in these things is very, very high. Um, I have, uh, you know, looked around to see what other people are saying about the current Oz machine company, Roosevelt, and everybody is essentially saying the same thing. These are being made perfectly. Uh, anybody who's looking, you know, if you're, if you're looking to support an American company, right, and it's a big thing to you to have you know, most of the knife made in the United States. Well, listen, everything is being made in the United States here. And if you listen, if you want to say, like, I, oh, I, I've got American pocket knives and they, they only cost me like, you know, $80, $90, $100, $150, dollars, right? Let me tell you, the reason that they don't cost as much is, um, number one, volume. Massive, massive volume. Most likely uh, you bought something that's being made by a company who has an enormous capacity for you know, like, like an output, output capacity. It's just really high. Number two, not everything is being made in the United States, right? It's, it's probably the majority of, you know, the knife is made in the United States, but there's a lot of parts and things being outsourced and cut elsewhere. Maybe a lot of the assembly is done in the United States, right? There's no way around it. It's just, it's really easy to just lean on this sort of imaginary idea of greed, right? Well, they're greedy. That's why. No, that's just a really lazy conclusion to come to, right? Just to just admit that you don't know, right? Because I remember thinking that too. I'm not trying to come down on anybody, right? It's hard to it's hard to say, wow, maybe I just don't know what I'm looking at, right? It's hard. People don't want to do that. Right? You want to come off like you know, right? Like you're smarter, right? That's why. Well, I'm I'm clearly more intelligent because I I got a bargain, but this company, right? Who's not trying to no. It's just expensive to do this. That's what this is. You don't have to like it, but it's expensive to do this. I want to make sure that people know this is confusing, right? If you're brand new to the knife world, it's confusing. So who's, who's this guy talking about this? He's got this little titanium pocket. He's, he's telling me an entry level one of these is $700. Who is this guy? What? what? I get it. It's confusing, right? I want to make sure you guys get the right information. Um, Yeah, this is beautiful. This is awesome. Very simple, very straightforward. But, you know, if you're going to do that, then there should be character in the design, right? You should be able to feel the idea, right? The philosophy behind the design. It should not feel like something that was just spit out for the, um, you know, just to cater to some broad range of people, you know? No, this feels like heart and soul. It feels like, you know, very, very specifically designed to feel like an optimized EDC cutting tool. Um, and the added benefit is that every last part of it is made in the United States. I think they outsource the heat treat to Peters, but that's everybody, right? Hinderer does that. Tons of 
you know, all in-house USA companies are using Peter's Heat Treat. It's been that way for a very, very long time. Really impressive that we're getting Magna Cut at 63.64. This is this is really cool. Seven hundred dollars, right? It's a lot of money. Um, you know, you can get uh, you, you can certainly get US full USA made knives or like ninety nine percent USA made knives for a little bit less. But you're going to be buying from a company who has a larger output, right? Getting your hands on one of these, you're going to have to fight for it. Um, these are not easy to acquire. You really do have to get lucky. Um, and it's, it's going to be one of those things where you just really, really want very specifically the Oz Machine Company Roosevelt. But anybody who picks one of these up, yeah, you're going to be satisfied with it. It's, it's exactly what I would want to see spending that much money with a company like this. So this is kind of rambly, right? I just, when I unbox this thing, uh, I had, there were some people like, oh, you know, oh my gosh, $700. And I just really felt like that was, that was kind of unfair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's just what you can expect. I mean, people, everybody's, you know, rah, rah, rah and wanting to support America, you know, and I get that and I'm on, I'm on your side, right? But it's like, you want to be able to complain and say, why well, don't even, you got to buy USA, right? And then you turn around and people are like, all right, we made this thing here, right here. It's, it's just me and a couple other people in a small shop, Attica, Indiana, trying to make this stuff in USA. Here it is. Right? People are like, oh my God, look at that price. I don't want to, I don't want to support America that bad. <laughs> I get it. It's expensive, right? But man, it's like pick a lane. Anyways, sorry. I chose the Oz Machine Company Roosevelt to, you know, to get up on my soapbox. Uh, this is going on my recommended knives playlist. It's very rare that I will put a knife that is this expensive on that playlist, right? But it is, I recommend this for people who are, not to, not necessarily to everybody, but if you're going to spend this much money on a knife, this is a knife that I recommend. It's also gonna go on my favorite knives of all time playlist because I just love the overall, the profile, the ease of manipulation, the ergonomic uh, profile, the ergonomic experience, <laughs> right? All of that, it's just wonderful. These are fantastic. I really wanted to keep this. I said, can I buy this please? And he said, no. <laughs> He won't let me buy it. Apparently, this already has a home. So I'll have to get in line like everybody else. I, I want one of these in my collection for sure. Um, thanks again to Oz Machine Company for uh, loaning this to me for review. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives. They're either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.